So I, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you now my dear friend, Archbishop Fred Hiltz, the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, our full communion partner, and call on him now to address us. Fred and I were both elected in Winnipeg 10 years ago, and Fred, I remember very well when you came over to this very hall to congratulate me in front of our church. Um, over that time, Fred, you really have become one of us. I have heard members of our church refer to you as being our Fred. I, I want to thank you for being such a wonderful colleague and for being a very dear friend. You too have become my brother, and um, I invite all of you to join me in welcoming our Fred. Good morning, one and all. Morning, it is a great delight to be here with you for the 16th Biennial National Convention of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. And what a fantastic first day you had. A Mennonite preacher at the opening Eucharist, a stern report from your National Indigenous Bishop, wonderfully reflective as always of her great love for this church, and her pride in the ministry that you all do together. A powerful address by Bishop Munib Yunan, an honoring of Don Storch for his outstanding service to your church, times of praise to the glory of God, and times of prayer trusting in that great truth that we are indeed liberated by God's grace. It is my distinct privilege to bring you greetings from the Anglican Church of Canada, all of your brothers and sisters. It is by God's grace that we share a full communion relationship, the seeds of which were sown some 40 years ago, tended and watered by the theologians and pastors of our church and by the imagination and prayers of the faithful, that seed budded and blossomed into the Waterloo Declaration in 2001. And in the past 16 years, it has borne fruit beyond our imagining, both nationally and locally. I want you all to know <clears throat> that we love Pat Lovell as much as you love Cynthia Haynes Turner. <laughs> In January this year, I had the wonderful privilege of spending a Sunday at St. David, St. Patrick, and St. Paul's Anglican Lutheran Parish in Guelph. And what a joy to worship with that congregation, to behold the partnership of ministry at the time between Pastor Jeff Smith and Father Tom Vaughan, and then to share lunch with the leaders of a team dedicated to formalizing the arrangements for this joint parish. And as more and more of these kind of parishes begin to emerge, it is really good to see that our joint Anglican Lutheran Commission has established a working group to examine the polity of our respective churches and what of those polities we need or not need to bring to bear upon the establishment of joint parishes in the spirit of full communion. Now the mission of this church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, as an instrument of the universal church and as an instrument of the Holy Spirit is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in Canada and around the world through the proclamation of the word, the administration of the sacraments, and through service in Christ's name. That's your mission statement, and it's front and center in your annual report for 2016. And I want to say to all of you, that there are a couple of things about your church that I so, so appreciate. One is the way you worship. The liturgical resources that you have are absolute gifts to the whole church. And I want to also take opportunity to commend the ELCIC 
for the quality of your written resources. And the annual report for 2016 is just such a wonderful example of the, that quality of which I speak. Special kudos to Trina Gallup and her team. Your annual report tells of compelling stories of your commitment to the fullness of the gospel. And it really, in such practical ways, helps everybody, all parishioners, to see how their offerings support the work of the church through their congregations, synods, and national expression of the church. The report introduces an incredible staff team working in and out of your national office here in Winnipeg, all of whom I have come to know as having this approach to their work. It's a servant ministry to the whole church. As Bishop Susan just made reference to this, 10 years ago in this very room, the room was configured differently, but 10 years ago in this very room, Susan was elected as your national bishop. And it's a moment for me, with all of you, to say how much I appreciate her strong and steadfast leadership. I want you all to stand with me. You and I know that Susan has done so much to nurture your commitment to be a church in mission for others. In her travels, in her preaching and speaking, Susan embodies all that you strive for. Spirited discipleship, healthy church, compassionate justice, effective partnerships. Susan and I speak by phone every six weeks or so. And it is those calls that have in large measure nurtured not only our collegial relationship as church leaders, but our deep and our abiding friendship in Christ. Those calls are ones in which we're able to share many of the delights and challenges in the ministries of oversight entrusted to us for a time. And our genuine care for one another is, for me, a blessing beyond all measure. Not only is Susan a treasure within your own church, but she is held in high regard within ours. Within the Lutheran World Federation, you will know, some of you will know, that she is effectively, affectionately known as Her Grace. <laughs> the Vice President for North America, a role she just completed at the Assembly in Namibia. Her Grace. Within ecumenical circles, Susan has become a well-seasoned leader with much to offer by way of acquired wisdom and counsel. You know, and I know, she speaks up and she speaks out. And she writes with an economy of words that goes to the heart of the matter she's addressing and the essence of her call to action to the church. She laughs a lot and she cries too. She loves to travel. She loves to sing. And in recent years, I've noticed that she loves to knit, to knit her way through church meetings that go on and on and on for hours and hours and hours and sometimes for days on end. You might also note that she loves fashion. And she has a real thing, it seems, for bags and purses and shoes. <laughs> Don't you, Bishop? So I thought that in recognition of the 10th anniversary of her time as National Bishop that I should bring a little gift. But I would not dare to presume to choose a bag or a purse <laughs> or a pair of shoes lest I fail to measure up to her standard. I did bring a little something though and I actually think that she might like it. Suffice to say, yes. Well, if she doesn't, her vice chair will, I think. <laughs> <coughs> S 
simply to say how blessed you are and how blessed the whole church is by Susan Johnson's ministry as national bishop. Let all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Susan and I have the distinct privilege of hosting joint meetings of our senior staff uh, from time to time and also the annual joint meeting of the House of Bishops and the, and the Conference of Bishops. And at our spring meeting this year, we were honored to have as our guest and teacher one of great ELCIC and Waterloo Lutheran Seminary renown, David Frimmer. And among other things that David did when he was with us was to helpfully survey the history of ecumenism in Canada, making a distinction between pastoral and public ecumenism. He defined pastoral ecumenism as being about building relationships, trust, and accompanying one another to expand the ecumenical family. Public ecumenism, he said, is about churches willing to engage with society and to help build, care, and guide the nation and the world. And he made the observation that in Canada, public ecumenism has in fact been more prominent than pastoral ecumenism. And he went on to give us a great long list of all the ways in which working together, the churches through public ecumenism have exerted for good the shape of many public policies, everything from health care to uh, human rights issues to housing to reconciliation, on and on the list goes. And then he spoke of a public multi-faithism, a process of interfaith encounter by faith communities that together articulate public theological narrative that leads to a national and global citizenship that cares for the country and the world. And in that very spirit, you are taking wonderful steps in this convention with your guideline for encountering people of other faiths and your statement to Muslims. These, I am sure, will be powerfully sacred moments in this gathering. And I believe the Anglican Church of Canada, indeed all of the churches in Canada, could take a very good lead from your initiative. Last July, just about this time, Anglicans gathered in General Synod in Toronto under the theme, You Are My Witnesses. And Bishop Susan and the Reverend Jordan Cantwell, God bless them, sat through every session. Surely there are a few stars in their crowns. And I want to say how much we Anglicans appreciate their presence and their attention particularly through our very lengthy and difficult deliberation over a proposed amendment to our marriage canon that would make provision for same-sex marriage in our church. I want to thank Susan and Jordan for listening and for praying with us and for us. We have some distance to go to a second reading of the proposed change at our next General Synod in 2019. The United Church of Canada and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada remind me that there is life beyond this debate. There is life beyond uh, a preoccupation with what for many people is indeed a pastoral matter that ultimately works itself out locally. So I thank you for your interest and I ask for your continued prayers as we continue this journey in our church. I have so admired your interest as a church in the work of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Although you ran none of the Indian residential schools, 
your participation in regional and national TRC events in gestures of reconciliation that accompany them and in public declarations that you have made with respect to honoring the 94 calls to action from the TRC have demonstrated to all Canadians that only as we all work together can we work toward reconciliation and guide our country in a new and a different way in relationship with the first peoples of this land. Thank you, too, for your deep interest in how we Anglicans are engaging the whole matter of self-determination for Indigenous peoples within the Anglican Church and their quest for a truly Indigenous expression of the Church through liturgy, patterns for ministry, customs for raising up leaders, including bishops, and governance in accord with Indigenous ways of decision-making. As I look back to our joint assembly in 2013 in Ottawa, I give thanks for the work by way of follow-up to the joint declaration on homelessness and affordable housing, responsible resource extraction, and I want especially to thank Paul Gares for his outstanding work in this regard. With Bishop Susan, I do regret that we could not proceed with further planning for a joint assembly in 2019 in Vancouver. But I do remain convinced that as difficult as that decision to postpone was, it was rooted in a profound respect for the limits of one another's financial resources and the constraints of time bearing down upon both the General Synod and the National Convention and the work that each of us must do when we gather in 2019. Though the decision to postpone was hard and disappointing and I think dis disheartening for some, I do believe that the capacity to even engage such a conversation is a sign of the maturity of our relationship as churches in full communion and our respect for the very nature of full communion. In announcing our decision, endorsed by the National Church Council and the Council of General Synod, Susan and I were very glad to call for a joint assembly in 2022. Then we'll be able to celebrate 20 years in full communion. And who knows, we might just go back to Waterloo. I continue to give thanks for the incredibly fine work of our Joint Commission that watches and supports and encourages and challenges, challenges us to live boldly into our full communion relationship. With special thanks to Andre Laverne for his incredibly fine staff support. I rejoice in the National Worship Conference and I look forward to gatherings of clay. It remains for me the biggest, most hope-filled expression of full communion we have, a real celebration of the minds and the voices and the hearts and hands of young leaders in both of our churches who gather from all across Canada. Last year, clay was on the clay of beautiful Prince Edward Island, and it was a fabulous gathering, completely, completely oriented around the sub-themes of liberated by God's grace, salvation not for sale, human beings not for sale, creation not for sale. I don't know about Bishop Susan, but I have an awful pile of t-shirts from conferences and synods and <laughs> God knows what, but this one is my favorite. And it's dirty and that's okay, because some of it is PEI dirt and some of it is simply dirt from wearing it all the time. Next year we'll be in Thunder Bay and it promises to be equally a fabulous gathering. So as I bring these greetings to a close on behalf of the Anglican Church of Canada, I want to do so in the manner in which St. Paul extended greetings to the church in Thessalonica. This is what he wrote. We always give thanks to God for all of you, and we mention you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father 
your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you and all the work that you are about in this convention, in your synods, and in every parish across this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. I, I know that you know this, but I want to say again how much I value our personal relationship, but how much our church appreciates our full communion relationship. We are changed churches after this many years of being in full communion, and there is no turning back. We may, may not yet be Anglorans and Luthercans, but we're getting closer all the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>